a little bit about my story. So when I was at secondary school, the only thing that I wanted to be was a speech and language therapist. I didn't ever want to do medicine or do English and perhaps be a teacher. Do come in, it's fine. Um, and so I uh, discovered there was this thing called speech and language therapy. I wanted to work with children who had speech and language difficulties and that's all I wanted to be. And so um, I did my A-levels, I went to university, I did a four-year degree to become a speech and language therapist. And then I was working in London and I began to have a sense, I, was, I had already made the decision to be a Christian uh, by then and I had a strong sense that I was being called into the church. And I was absolutely passionate about people flourishing the church I was involved in was about how do you help communities flourish. At that time, women could not be ordained priests. I'm going to sound ever so old, because this was going back um, to the 1990s. And uh, I still went forward to train um, to be ordained in the church, but I knew that I couldn't be ordained as a priest. But in my final year at Theological College, it became possible something called the General Synod, which is like the Church of England's Parliament, uh, finally agreed that women could be ordained priest. So those of you who perhaps um, are from a faith background of some sort will know that actually in most faiths over the centuries, women and men have not been treated equally. And for me, people would quote uh, the Bible and say that women shouldn't be in leadership, uh, that Jesus was a man, uh, they'd quote tradition. Whereas actually my own reading of scripture and my own understanding of faith was that this was something cultural. It was not about women not being able to be equal with men. And so throughout my story, and what I hope in your story, my passion has always been that I want to be the person I believe God has created me to be. I want you to become the people you are. As I look out at you, I don't know you, I've met some of you this morning, none of you look the same. All of you will have different passions, different gifts, different skills, and I want you not to be stopped by anything to be the person that you have been created to be. So for me, it became possible for women to be ordained <coughs> priest, um, and I became a priest. I worked in London in um, an area of urban deprivation. And at that stage, discussions were going on about, well, we've let women be priests, could they now be bishops? And that discussion went on for about 20 years. And throughout all of that, and even now, there are people in Gloucestershire who don't believe I should be the bishop. Um, there are people who hold different theological views. And I want to respect those views, and it's something I might talk with you a little bit uh, about later. I don't want to criticise all those who hold different theological perspectives from me, but I'm passionate about how do we live in a world where people hold different views, <coughs> but actually we are still confident in who we are. And that's what I really want you to, what my real hope for you is that you will be confident about who you are. What I have done throughout my life is constantly say, what are my gifts, what are my skills? Actually, who am I to be? In all of that, probably like lots of you, I have really lacked confidence. I'm sure that some of you think, Oh, am I really good at that? And you may know there's been some research that shows um, when women apply for jobs, they look at an, a job advert, they'll say, oh, I can do that, 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 that. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not going to apply. Whereas men, generalisation, but often will say, oh, I can do that, 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 that. Can't do that, but that's okay. And so there's something about having confidence in having a go at something. So for me, I've needed people around me who've really encouraged me to say, actually, we believe you have the gifts and skills to do these things. And so even now at school, I really hope you'll have good friends around you who will actually really affirm you and tell you what you are good at and encourage you to have a go at things. We've just been having a conversation about having a go at things and failing. If you're really successful all the time, 
you become quite risk averse. You don't have a go at something and think, well, let's have a go at this. And if it fails, okay, I'm still confident in who I am. So I really want you to, want you to hear, you need people around you who will encourage you and affirm you. I would not be standing here now if it wasn't that people around me had said, we really believe that you've got the gifts and skills to do that. So it wasn't until 2014 that women could become bishops. I know that's very recent. Um, and I've been one of those amongst many people who've really been campaigning for women to be able to be bishops and be equal with men. Not because I wanted to be a bishop. If you told me that one day I'd be a bishop, that would have made me run a mile. Um, but my story has taken twists and turns. And so when I was asked if I would be interviewed to uh, become the next Bishop of Gloucester, again, I said, not me, not me. And then I agreed to look at the paperwork and various people had said, actually, I think it's, it plays to your gifts and skills. And I'd felt actually this was something that God was calling me to do. I would have a go, I would go for the interview. So I don't stand here now as someone who says, I've got all the answers, I've got everything right. But I am confident in saying, I need to go on becoming the person I've been created to be. And that will sometimes mean failing, it will sometimes mean getting things wrong, it will also mean getting some things right and being who I am and using my gifts and skills. Now for me, as a person of faith, I can talk about it from that point of view and say, actually I believe this is what God has called me to. I know that for some of you that will feel strange hearing me say that, I'm happy to pick up on those things. But in all of that, the other bit that's been really strong has been how I cope with conflict. Because there will be people in your lives, people in my <coughs> life, who say, mm, I'm not sure you can do that. Who even now say, mm, I'm not sure if a girl can do that or can a woman do that. I've been interested to know if you've had that experience ever. And actually for me, I was saying to some people earlier, one of the reasons that uh, my cross that I wear, every bishop has a cross, is actually made of bullet shell cases. Um, made uh, from bullets that were used in the Civil War in Mozambique in Africa. And for me, having these made into a cross, it's about saying, actually, we can transform the bad and the evil things, and we can actually use them for good. And for me, when I uh, find myself in situations of conflict, it's not about walking away from those people who don't agree with me or think I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. It's about how I stand face to face with them and say it doesn't stop us having a good relationship even if we really disagree. And when I look out at our world, I see a world where people cannot live with difference. When I look at what the awful tragedy that's happened in Manchester, when I look at what's going on in Syria, when I look at what's going on in some of our streets in Gloucestershire, people cannot live easily with those who are different from themselves. <coughs> And actually, I hope in the leadership you will exercise, you will be those who will learn how to really disagree with people, but also be able to stay in relationship and be confident in who you are. So uh, when I became bishop, I became the first female diocesan bishop. There are now two of us who are um, in charge of dioceses, which are a bit like um, areas within the country. Uh, so I cover Gloucestershire, a bit of South Gloss, little bits around the edges. I also found myself um, thrown very quickly into becoming a member of the House of Lords. So I now find myself um, as the first female bishop to also sit in the House of Lords. So I've had a really steep learning curve. So I don't want to pretend it's been easy. It hasn't. But actually, continually knowing yourself, going on discovering who you are, who you are deep inside, not what you look like on the outside, who you are deep inside, is really important. For me, it's going to be a lifelong journey. And that's what's really helped me, with my faith, discover who I am and to go on uh, in leadership. And that's what I hope for you. So I'm going to pause there, because I don't want to tell you things you're not interested in. Um, I would love to hear some of the difficult questions, comments you've got, and then I'll respond to those. When you look at the Bible, it can seem as if some of the women presented in the Bible might be presented in quite a negative way. I think that's because of the lens 
that we have chosen to look through. So when I look at Jesus, Jesus was radical. I mean, in that day, in that country, a man, a Jewish man, talking with women, having women as friends, was radical. And so that's the story I want to tell. So let's look at this through a different lens. And say, so actually, those women, when it came to uh, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, actually, do you know what? Most of the men had run and fled and disappeared, but the women stood at the cross. Um, the tomb, when the tomb was found to be empty, who went to the tomb? It was the women. So how do we retell? Not against men. This isn't, let's be anti-men. This would be, how are we men and women together? Because I believe, actually, it's about how we complement one another, how we work together. So I think it's about how we tell the story in a different way with a different narrative, because I think there are lots of amazing stories um, in the Bible about women that are often uh, not told. So last week I was about Esther, who's a character in the Old Testament, who actually was the one who saved the Jews from persecution. It's a story that's not often told. So how do we retell the stories? The way I respond to people who think I shouldn't be a bishop, um, when it's really vitriolic, and some of us from social media earlier, when I see things on social media, or I read things in the media that says I shouldn't be a bishop, I think it's about ignoring them. And that's not about being cowardly and going, oh, I can't cope with that, I'm not going to look at that. It's actually about having confidence in who I am and saying, actually, I don't need to look at that. You can have your opinion. If you want to have a discussion with me to respect me, then I'll have that discussion. If you're just going to be rude and vitriolic, that's not respecting me, and I respect myself more than that. If it's those who have genuine struggles, and there are those who really find it really hard and think women shouldn't be bishops, then I'd say, let's have a conversation, let's talk about it. Not because we're going to change one another's minds. We often think, don't we, in place of difference, if we battle it out for long enough, will change one another's minds. Often we won't. But can we learn to get to know one another so you see me as a human being and know who I am and I see you as a human being and know who you are and then say, but we hold very different views on this. We don't have to be best friends, although there are people I've developed quite deep friendships with who don't believe I should be a bishop. Because actually I think we need to model, and I believe as a Christian I need to model to the world out there how we live with difference. That's not to say it doesn't hurt sometimes, of course it does. Um, but actually, it's about being vulnerable enough to say, actually, when you say that, that's quite painful. I'm not going to crumble under it, but I am going to say, actually, perhaps you could word that in a different way. And at the end of the day, I respect you have a different view from me. I hold a different view from you, and we've got to work out how we live with those. But it's not always easy. Um, that's an interesting question. I was brought up in a family where I was taken to church, but I was allowed to make choices for myself. I think for me, my faith grew very gradually, um, and I began to see in other people around me that this was something I was quite attracted to, this Christian faith, and then I made a decision for myself that actually I wanted to have a real relationship with Jesus and therefore I was going to say yes to being a Christian. Again, I wouldn't want to give the impression it's been easy. I wouldn't want to give the impression um, that there haven't been times in my life where that's been difficult. But I think it's like in any relationship that that's really held me. And so my faith in God is very strong. That's a question about if we experience prejudice, whether it be in the workplace, school, anywhere else in our lives, what would my encouragement be? Can I ask you a question first? Who thinks that they've ever experienced prejudice or discrimination because you're a girl? So I'd be quite interested to know how you cope with it. One of the things I would say is about being confident in who you are. Um, now, none of us are completely confident in who we are because we're constantly changing and going on becoming who we are. But I think that's, again, when you have friends around you, who can go on encouraging you and saying, actually, you're really good at this, or I really value this about you. So you go on growing in your confidence and actually knowing that you are a unique individual. You are all unique individuals, and to be proud of that. Then I think there's something that when someone else attacks you or says you shouldn't be doing that, or 
you're not good enough, you know, boys are better, or you're not good enough as a girl. To be able to say, I am me. I'm not trying to be you, and you're not trying to be me, but I am me, and actually I'm comfortable with that. And so yes, you can have your views, but they're not gonna change who I am. I think it's really important. The flip side of that is don't let yourselves become hard. One thing I think that I've really tried to learn over these is not to do the blame. So not to say, oh, that's really awful. That's all those awful people over there, because then I'm not living with difference well. And not to let yourselves become hard and get a chip on your shoulder, which is, well, I'm better than you are. But to say, no, I'm different from, from you. You hold that view. I hold this view. Um, if people have got genuine criticisms, let's listen to those. But if it's just discrimination, you know, pure prejudice because of gender, then actually um, I want to be able to challenge that or not put myself in a vulnerable place if that person's quite bullying, then have the respect and the confidence to walk away from that and say, do you know what? If you think I'm fabulous, that doesn't change who I am. And if you think I'm dreadful, that doesn't change who I am. Actually, I'm who I am, and I'm confident in who I am. And therefore, do you know what? I can go and do this. Because I think the flip side of experiencing discrimination, which puts us down, is also when you have the kind of discrimination you get with celebrities that says they're so marvellous because, and then they get very arrogant or think they're more important than people. I'm no more important than you. You're no more important than me or the person sitting next to you. We are all equal and we are different. And so if someone tells you you're absolutely wonderful and you're better than someone else, don't be fooled by that either. Just as if someone tells you you're far worse than someone else, do not be fooled by that. Go on becoming who you are. That would be my advice. Go on becoming who you are and be confident in that. <laughs> Let's go back to where I started saying we are all equal. I suspect that if I was of a different race, different sexuality, um, and of course that's assuming that you know what my sexuality is. Um, but it's important though, isn't it? Because we all make assumptions about one another, don't we? Which is really important. As we look at one another, we make assumptions and we judge. I'm quite sure there would be some things I would experience um, that would be a different set of prejudices. So I am absolutely passionate about how we are challenged and how we live out our, um, our equality and our differences, allowing people to be different, um, but also saying we're all equal. So I would say yes, and what I want to do is be an advocate and challenge some of that. So I will constantly say, in the Church of England on the whole, if you go into a church, most of the people, particularly in Gloucestershire, would be white. Um, they'd probably be of a certain age as well. Um, not all men. We've got, we've got a, a large number of women clergy in Gloucestershire. But actually, I'm a real advocate of saying, how are we changing that? How are we really changing the face of that? Um, so then that links to, uh, would I be an advocate? Is that the right word? Uh, yeah, would you defend? Yeah, would I defend? Thank you. Sorry, I didn't want to put words in charge. Would I defend? Absolutely, I would. I would defend. Right, it's not for me to tell you who you should be or what you should be. There are certain values that I'm going to challenge. So I'm not going to say, actually, if you're someone who wants to go into a concert and blow yourself up, that's fine. That is not fine. And I will challenge those things. And I will speak out when something's evil. I will challenge for evil. But when it's about someone living those values and being different from someone else, whether that's about uh, sexuality, race, anything like that, I will absolutely speak out on it and defend it. The question about gay marriage is entering into something slightly different theologically for me. So um, for me, that's not about discriminating about people being equal but it raises theological questions for me. Um, and probably the reason I'm not going to answer that fully is because um, I haven't answered that fully even within the diocese. And the reason for that is not because I'm not willing to share my own personal views on things, because I think I like to think I am quite open. It's because I have to be a focus for unity. And at the moment, you'll be aware, many of you will be aware, that the Church of England 
as with many other uh, churches and different faiths, are really in a process of talking about how do we understand marriage? How do we understand um, same-sex relationships? And we're still in that conversation where we're trying to allow people to express different viewpoints um, whilst we continue to come to decision. And so as a bishop at the moment, I feel I have to hold um, all of that. But I absolutely want to defend the right of every person to be equal. If somebody came to you and said that I am, you know, I'm a horrible person, I feel like I'm the bully, I'm the bad guy, but I feel that's really who I am, yeah. would, you, would you try and change who they are? Thank you, that's a really good question. That's a question about, um, it sounds as if I'm saying you should just be who you are, and therefore if someone came to you and they're a really bad, that they saw themselves a bad person, I'm just a really bad person, it's just who I am, would I try and change them? Um, I don't think I've got the power to change anyone. Uh, what I have the power to do, the only power I have is to change myself. And so I think seeing ourselves as very powerful agents in discussion with other people. So I'd want to ask that person questions. I'd want to ask, be really curious about why they see themselves like that. What is it that's made them be like that? Is that how they want to be? Because I suspect if someone was coming to me and saying, I'm a really bad person or I'm a bully, as you were just saying, you know, that's just how I am. Is that really who they want to be? I suspect there's probably some unhappiness under there and they'd actually want to be something different. I can't change them, but I can help them to think about who they are. If they said, so this is who I am and is that okay? I would absolutely say no, because I don't believe that's who you've been created to be. I think you have uh, influence within you for good. So, I, so again, looking at Manchester, in all the tragedy and the evil of what has happened there, the power of all those people who've been doing good to one another and speaking out and doing acts of kindness to one another, I think is far more powerful. So how do we say each of us can make choices, can use who we are to influence the world in good ways? And I'd want to challenge them. So alongside me saying, be who you are, I have a strong set of values about what I think the world should be like and what we need if we're all to flourish. Because if that person sees us as a bad person or a bully, they're not actually saying, I can be who I am, because they're not going to be working for my flourishing. So how do we all be who we are to work for the flourishing of everyone else, which goes back to the um, sexuality and the race question, if I want everyone to flourish? So that would be my challenge. What does a bishop actually do? That's a really good question. I find it really, I wish I got a simple answer I could give. So, as the bishop, I am, if you like, the leader of the Church of England in this part of the country. So there are 42 Darson bishops, so the country is divided up into areas, but like it's divided into counties, it's divided into dioceses. And over each of those dioceses, there is an Anglican, a Church of England bishop. And my role is to set direction and vision with others, so with Sam and with Lucy and others um, who are on my staff team, to look at what sort of church do we want to be. So there are 400 churches in the Diocese of Gloucester. We have 117 church schools. So part of my role is how do we ensure that our churches and our schools are places that enable human flourishing. How do we enable people to come to faith if that's the choice that they want to make? How do we share our faith with others? Um, and also within that, because the Church of England is the established church of the country, whether or not our churches, uh, whether or not people uh, want to see that, um, actually part of my role is to be very engaged with the wider community. So it's engaging with charities, with businesses, with health, with education, to say, how do we need to be working for this to be a country in which all can flourish? So although I'd hold passionately to my Christian faith and being a follower of Jesus Christ, and that's why I stand here, and I obviously would want others to know that, because otherwise, why would I be a bishop? I also want to work with people of all faith and no faith to ensure that, um, our country is a good place to be. So I spend a lot of time in meetings. I spend a lot of time uh, visiting different people, a lot of time meeting with clergy. Um, there are about 300 clergy. A lot of time meeting with youth leaders, head teachers. Um, so there's a lot of management as well as um, 
taking services, but I don't do that all the time, on Sundays to enable people to grow in faith, to worship God. No two weeks look the same. One of the things I hold when I am in, I'm in church is a shepherd's crozier, shepherd's crook. And that's because one of the symbols throughout the centuries is uh, a calling for the bishop to be the chief shepherd. And a shepherd is both about caring for people and pastoring them and leading where they will follow. So it's about giving direction, but it's also that pastoral care as well. So I have a shepherd's crook, which if, I, if you ever see me in a service, you also wear a very funny pointy hat on my head. Isn't it also about hitting wolves? Hitting wolves. Well, it could yeah. be about, yeah, well, actually, that's true. Shepherd did hit wolves, yeah. so they're evil. Oh, very good. <laughs> One last question you've thought of it. Whilst you've been going through this in your career and life, who would you say has inspired you? Do you always find that question really difficult? You know, some people say, oh, I've got a real role model. Um, I think the people who've inspired, it's going to sound really corny, the people who've really inspired me has not been some great role model. It has been my friends and family around me who have encouraged me and inspired me. Or I've seen them do something that's inspired me. So for me, rather than seeing this as a career, for me as a Christian, it's been a vocation. It's been a sense of who is God calling me to be. Um, and one of my traumas, if you like, in the early 90s was the women were going, we haven't got any role models. We haven't got any women who are priests or women who are bishops. And then a very wise person said to me, um, why do you need a role model? Because you're you. And that role model is them. How do you go on being the person that you've been created to be? And I found that really helpful. And so often when young children think, you know, of celebrities as being their role model, I want to tease out why. And if that's about popularity, then what is it in yourself that might not be about being on the stage? What is it that makes you attractive to other people? Um, so I think those, I mean, having said that alongside that, in 94, I spent some time in South Africa, which some of you all know, at the um, end of apartheid, if it has truly ended, um, that actually it was the first elections uh, took place. And so people like Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu, um, I was working in his diocese at the time, just for two months, really inspired me. Because here were people who had all the odds stacked against them. And actually, they stood up for what they believed. And Nelson Mandela, who was in prison for all that time, he didn't become hard. He kept on fighting for what he believed in, but he didn't become hard. So they've, they've certainly inspired me.